Good evening, everyone. My name is Nor Soaida binti Mama Isa. Uh, I am from the Faculty of Fisheries and Food Science, uh, University of Malaysia, Terengganu. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the webinar. And I would like to also thank uh, LV Flow for inviting me today uh, to give a webinar entitled The Microfluidic Encapsulation of Bacteria in Emulsion Droplets. This is actually a part of my PhD program when I was at the University of Birmingham. So uh, joining us today as well is Robin Olivers, who will be uh, also from LV Flow, who will be joining us for the Q&A session uh, later. So without further ado, let, me start, let us start our webinar for today. All right, so this is basically what will be covered in this webinar today. So first of all, I will give a brief introduction about droplet microfluidics. Okay, for bacterial encapsulation. So why is it gaining so much interest nowadays to uh, apply droplet microfluidics for, for microbiological studies? And then uh, I will also explain to you uh, about bacteria in single water in all droplets. Okay, uh, the effect of bacteria on the droplets uh, stabilize, uh, stability. And then uh, after that, we will move forward to the encapsulation of bacteria in double water in all in water droplets and also the control release of bacteria from these droplets. And then we will finish it off with uh, the conclusion. Okay. So why microfluidic encapsulation? So why is it gaining so much interest nowadays to use droplet microfluidics for my microbiological studies? So this is, usually, this is actually due to previous studies whereby it has been found that encapsulation actually helps to protect bacteria against harsh conditions and ensure bacterial viability. Okay, so uh, for example, there's a study on, probi on probiotics bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, whereby they are being encapsulated inside uh, multiple droplets, multiple emulsion droplets, uh, which is the double emulsion droplets. And due to encapsulation, they are able to withstand the harsh condition of um, the gastric juice, okay, and increase uh, its viability, right? So this is one of the previous research that has been done, okay? And other than that, uh, emulsion droplets also are highly compatible with various chemical and biological reagents, okay? And it also increases uh, reaction efficiency and reduces the reagents that we use for a particular experiment because we are doing our experiment in a mi miniature way, right? And other than that, which is very important for microbiological studies, uh, the single cell encapsulation can be achieved through droplet microfluidics as well, right? And other than that, it also allows for the manipulation of droplets that act as a microenvironment for various microbiological studies, which I will explain to you further in the next slide. And then uh, other than that, which is very important for my study, is the product. it allows for the production of highly monodispersed droplets with the CV value of less than 5%. With, and, and then we can also control the size of the droplets that we are making and the droplet formats. For example, for making multiple emulsion, we are able to, con to set uh, like whether we want the droplets to have like a, an inner core or multiple core, two or three, okay, for compartmentalization, right? And then other than that, high encapsulation efficiency can also be achieved, okay, as compared to other methods of uh, encapsulation. Okay, so these are basically some of the previous uh, uh, studies that has been conducted uh, on, you know, for by using droplet microfluidics for microbiological studies. As I mentioned before, it has been used for the encapsulation of cells and, the, and DNA, etc. For example, from the study that, that has been conducted by Chang previously in 2015, whereby they studied the formation of biofilm inside a multiple inside a microfluidic generated uh, multiple, emulsion, uh, multiple emulsion droplets, okay? And other than that, there's also a study by Bodica et al. 2009, whereby they study uh, quorum sensing, uh, sorry, whereby they encapsulate cells at single cell level and they are able to study quorum sensing uh, behavior of these cells, okay? Because uh, usually quorum sensing are being known to initiate, to be initiated by, um, when the density of cells rises above a certain threshold level. But from this study, they are able to prove that actually uh, quorum sensing can also be initiated at single cell level. And they are also able to prove that uh, quorum sensing de uh, dependent growth uh, can also occur, right? And other than that, uh, it, 
Droplet microfluidics has also been used for drug and bioactive compound delivery. For example, this uh, from the study that has been conducted by Chan and in 2013. And as I mentioned previously, uh, it also helps in the production of monodispersed uh, emulsions, not only emulsions, but also foams. Okay. And other than that, it also, uh, which is quite interesting, is it allows for the manipulation of uh, uh, sorry, it allows for droplets manipulation for biological and chemical study. As you can see here from a study done by Jakila previously in 2013, uh, whereby they use droplet microfluidics to closely uh, monitor the growth of bacteria inside the droplets. And with microfluidic, with droplet microfluidics as well, they are able to like um, replenish the nutrient um, for continuous uh, observation of the growth. Okay, so for example, here the uh, like uh, the generation of microchemistats whereby they fuse the three droplets together, bacteria, chemical factor, and growth media, forming microchemistats, and then these microchemistats will will um, travel down the uh, microfluidic channel to the incubation segment whereby the the growth of the bacteria are being monitored closely. And then after some time, uh, to replenish the nutrient, uh, it will go to the exchange uh, segment whereby the microchemostats will be split into waste droplet and seed droplet. And then the seed droplet will be replenished with growth media, again with growth media and chemical factors. So this is like a cycle of uh, nutrient replenishing and also, uh, and therefore they are able to monitor the growth of the bacteria inside the droplet. So these are some of the many, many studies that has been conducted previously um, uh, on microbiological uh, microbiolog studies that has been conducted previously by uh, with the application of droplet microfluidics and it keeps on growing every day. Okay, so, um, but we have also, we have to also uh, take note of the challenges of using droplet microfluidics for bacterial study. Okay, so we have to take a step back in a way, okay? So, because actually, uh, when we encapsulate bacteria inside droplets, the bioprocesses inside the droplets may require like specific chemistry, or maybe the bacteria itself uh, may produce byproducts and perform microbiological reaction, for example, the formation of biofilm. And all these uh, changes and reaction will um, eventually affect the stability of the whole system, which is very important in when you are encapsulating uh, bacteria, okay? And therefore, a thorough understanding on the effect of bacteria on droplet stability is still needed in order to expand their applications, okay? So this is what my study is about. So we study the effect of bacteria encapsulated in these droplets on the stability of the whole system, okay? So, Basically, uh, we do uh, studies on bacteria in single water in all droplets and also double water in all in water droplets. So as we can see here in the picture here, this is the experimental setup that we have in our lab. So we use a pressure controller, which is an OB1 from LB Flow. So this pressure controller is very much um, more efficient to be used, especially when you are making double water in oil in water emulsion, okay? Because you need to um, actually control uh, simultaneously three uh, different flows of a solution at the same time, which is quite challenging if you are using, for example, syringe pump, okay? And other than that, by using pressure controller, you can also ensure a um, stable flow of solution in the uh, microfluidic device, right? So basically for making the double water in oil in water droplets, so we have the three um, uh, solution here. First of all is the W1 phase, which is the inner aqueous phase that contains the bacteria. In this case is E. coli, E. coli GFP, green fluorescence protein G, uh, E. coli. And then here is the middle phase, which is the oil phase, okay? So basically these two phases will flow through this uh, inlet. So the W1 phase, this is the inlet. And for the oil phase, this is the inlet. So these two phases with, will flow through this channel to the first junction, whereby at this junction, the water in oil droplets will be formed. Okay. And then the water in oil droplets will then flow through this channel down to the second junction, where the W2 phase uh, is being uh, 
introduce okay, uh, the outer aqueous phase. Okay, and then, then only you can get the um, the water in all in water droplets here, and then it, it, it is being collected in the Eppendorf tube here after we, before further study. Okay. So for making double uh, water in oil in water droplets, it is very important for you to, um, especially when you are doing a, a single step like this with a double junction uh, microfluidic device, it's very important to have the device uh, partially, uh, partially sophisticated. Okay, you have to make the device partially hydrophilic in order to ease the production of uh, water in oil in water droplets at the second junction. Okay, so the second starting from the second junction here, it has to be hydrophilic, hydrophilic. The condition of the wall has to be hydrophilic. Okay, so this is for the double water in oil in water droplets. Okay, but for the single water in oil droplets, it is much more simpler. So we only in which it's only include the uh, one junction only. Okay, all right. So these are the video of droplet um, formation. Okay, for the single uh, water in all droplets, we have um, we make the droplets at the first at the flow focusing junction here. All right. So whereby the device, um, okay, as you can see here, and it produce a, a quite mono, um, a highly mono dispersed droplets. Okay, and while for the double water in all in water droplets, the water in all in water droplets are being formed here at the second junction. Whereby, as I, can, as I mentioned before, this area here are rendered uh, hydrophilic. Okay, so uh, the design of the device and also the method used for um, for surface treatment of the microfluidic device are being introduced by Bayer et al. 2016. So if you're interested, you can always find this uh, paper to refer to, okay? So, all right. Okay, so we, firstly, we study the effect of bacteria encapsulation on the stability of the water in oil droplets. So we do a storage study, a five-day storage study of the samples. So. From the results that we obtain, uh, we can see that the droplets with E. coli are much more stable as compared to a uh, control samples that does not contain any bacteria. Okay, so actually encapsulation uh, with bacteria improves the stability of the uh, water, in, water in all droplets, right? As we can see here, the monodispersity of the droplets are being maintained after during five days of storage as compared to the control sample here. Okay. So therefore, uh, it can be concluded that the presence of E. coli actually improves the stability of water in oil droplets during storage. Okay, but we don't know how does this happen. Okay, what how the, the E. coli play a role in stabilizing the droplets? So that's why, and also what happened to the bacteria during encapsulation? Okay, how about the viability of the bacteria? So we did a further study and we do a bacterial viability study of the bacteria of the encapsulated bacteria. So we, from the results obtained, it, we can uh, we, we realize that encapsulation actually does not improve the bacterial viability, whereby we can see presence of dead cells, the PI positive cells. PI is propidium iodide, okay, after five days of storage. So uh, before I forgot, actually this the samples here, before we encapsulated it, we stained them with propidium iodide, Okay, and then after five days, uh, the with the presence of dead cells, we can see uh, some PI positive cells inside the droplets, right? So it tells you that that um, there's a there are dead cells, okay, inside the droplet. So we were wondering whether the dead cells play a role in the in the stability of the droplets. Okay, is there any difference between life and dead cells? So that's why we also conduct a bath assay, which is the short, the short for uh, bacterial adherence to hydrocarbon assay. And from the results that we obtain, it reveals that actually the affinity of the cells toward oil phase, towards the oil phase changes as it enters the death phase, okay? So uh, as bacteria enters the death phase, they become much more hydrophobic and they are more likely to be attached at the interface here, okay? So they are in a way act as a, a, a pickering particles that help in the stabilization of the droplets, okay? So 
from this result, it can be therefore it can be concluded that the presence of bacteria affects the stability of the water in all droplets in a way that it improves the stability, uh, especially for dead cells due to its high affinity towards the interface. Okay. So we're moving on with the uh, encapsulation of bacteria inside the water in or in water droplets. Okay, so this study actually has been recently published in the RSC Advances. Okay, so basically in this study, we investigated the effect of encapsulation on bacterial viability and metabolic activity, and also the effect of bacteria on droplet stability. And, also, and other than that, we also studied the release mechanism of bacteria from double emulsion that is being triggered by changes in osmotic balance and also a change in temperature. Okay, so this is uh, the, the uh, double emulsion that we produce. So we have the bacteria, the E. coli GFP in the inner aquaspace, as you can see in the picture here. And then it, it is being surrounded by the oil, fit, the, by the oil uh, layer here, and then uh, the outer face, which is indicated by the W2 face, okay? All right. So we also do bacterial viability studies. So we wanted to know, is there any difference in terms of bacterial viability when you encapsulated it in double emulsion instead of in single water in oil droplets, okay? So from the results, we see that the presence of nutrients, okay, in either of the aqueous phases, whether it's in the W1 or W2 or both of the phases, helps to improve the viability of the bacteria. Okay, so when we encapsulate bacteria with nutrient inside water in or in water droplets, it helps uh, to improve the viability of the bacteria. Okay, so from the results, this provides an indication that nutrients actually are able to cross through the oil layer from the W2 phase into the W1 phase. As you can see here in the results, for the samples that only have nutrient in the, this LB is the nutrient, so uh, for the samples that only have nutrient in the outer phase, the uh, increase in cells number is comparable to the one that has uh, nutrient in both of the phases, inner and, inner and outer aquaspace, okay? So other than that, encapsulation also improves bacterial viability, as you can see here, for the unencapsulated samples in DNS water, we can see a reduction in cells number, but for the encapsulated samples, uh, you can see that uh, there is not much difference in terms of um, uh, cells number, okay, after 24 hours of incubation, right? So this is because the oil layer may act as a protective uh, barrier, okay? So this has also been uh, reported previously in other previous studies as well, okay? So other than that, uh, we also did study on the metabolic activity uh, of the bacteria when they are being encapsulated. So from the results obtained, we can we see that the encapsulated bacteria actually has a higher metabolic activity as compared to free cells. As you can see from the results here, uh, with higher uh, higher glucose consumption was observed for the encapsulated uh, samples as compared to this one here, the unencapsulated samples. Okay. So other than that, other than the study of the viability and the metabolic activity of the bacteria, we also do um, the control release study of the bacteria from the water in oil in water droplets. Okay? This is uh, triggered by the osmotic balance. So we produce two conditions of the droplets. First is in hyperosmotic condition, whereby you have the salt uh, NaCl in the outer phase. Okay? Uh, so this will cause the water from the W1 phase to be drawn out into the W2 phase and makes the droplet actually shrink, right? And then we also uh, produce the droplets in hyposmotic condition, whereby we have the salt in the inner aqueous phase. So this will cause the water from the W2 phase to move into the W1 phase and cause and make the droplet swells. Okay. So from the results that we get. Uh, we can see that the rate of bacteria release is actually higher in hyposmotic condition uh, as compared to hyposmotic condition. Okay, hyposmotic is where you have the salt in the W2 phase. Okay, so this also indicates that the droplets that are being produced in hyposmotic condition is much more or less stable 
as compared to the droplets that are being produced in hypoosmotic condition, okay, and thus a uh, higher release of bacteria, okay. And other than that, it is also being uh, affected by surfactant concentration, whereby at a uh, higher whereby higher bacteria release are being observed at lower surfactant concentration, okay. And other than that, we also reveal a two-step mechanism of the bacteria release, okay, in which, uh, first of all, is the splitting of the water in oil in water droplets, releasing the W1 uh, droplet as a secondary emulsion, okay. As you can see here, this is the splitting process of the drop of the um, double emulsion droplets, okay, and then from the secondary uh, emulsion droplets here, okay. As we can see here, the bacteria kept, are kept inside the W1 phase, even though the oil phase is not there anymore, okay, it has been split from the droplets, right? So uh, these bacteria here are being kept in the W2 phase by a very thin layer of um, surfactant, but really this requires a much more, uh, much more studies are still required to in order to confirm this, okay? All right. And then, uh, for the release of the bacteria, okay, after the droplets uh, splitting, uh, the collapse of the water in of these droplets then uh, release the bacteria into the W2 phase, okay, as you can see here in this picture, okay. Okay, and then other than osmotic balance, we also did a study on the control release of bacteria uh, with changes in temperature, okay, during the freezing and thawing of emulsion droplets. Okay, and um, we see that control release can also be done uh, from, by doing, uh, by changing the temperature of the storage, okay, uh, whereby the, uh, the bacteria are being kept inside the water, inside the W1 phase during the freezing stage. And then the immediate release of bacteria can be achieved uh, by immediately towing uh, the droplets, all right, to release the bacteria, okay? So as a conclusion, uh, we can see that the application of droplet microfluidics for the formation of single and double water in all in water droplets ensure the production of highly monodispersed droplets with high encapsulation efficiency, which is quite challenging to be achieved with other methods, for example, other methods of uh, emulsion production, for example, homogenization method. Okay. And then uh, the presence of bacteria also improves the, the droplet stability. Uh, in the case of water in all droplets. And then other than that, the microfluidic encapsulation of bacteria in the double emulsion droplets improved bacterial viability as compared to encapsulation in the in single water in all droplets, okay? As all layers serves as a protective barrier and a semi-permeable membrane that allows nutrient to pass through uh, from the, between the aqueous phases, right? And then, uh, other than that, droplet microfluidics also allows for a detailed mechanism of bacteria release, okay? Whereby, it, this is because we are able to really control uh, the droplet that, are we, that we are making, okay? We can uh, really fix that we want, for example, a single core water in all droplets, whereby this is very, this cannot, whereby it cannot be achieved with other methods, for example, homogenization method, okay? So, these are some of the further reading. If you are very interested in droplet microfluidics, check out this uh, website from LVFlow, and they also offer free uh, microfluidic tutorials for uh, for everyone. Okay, so that's all from me. Thank you for your time, and now we invite Robin Olivers for the Q and A session. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Sue again for this very nice presentation that was uh, highly appreciated. So again, uh, as usual, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free yes. to ask them in the in the chat box and uh, soon I will be happy to, to help uh, answering them. So uh, first question uh, from uh, Andrew. Uh, Elusu, what do you mean by high encapsulation efficiency? Could you elaborate a bit on that, please? Yes, uh, thank you for your very good question. So high encapsulation efficiency meaning uh, we don't, uh, when we make the droplets, we don't have uh, like, we don't find any bacteria inside the W2 phase. So all the 
during the uh, encapsulation session, uh, uh, encapsulation of bacteria, all the bacteria are in the W1 phase. So we are able to achieve this like around a very high encapsulation efficiency of around 99%. Okay, but when we use, when we do my encap uh, droplet, when we do a uh, droplet microfluidic encapsulation of bacteria, okay, instead of other methods of encapsulation, for example, uh, homogenization method, okay, whereby we are not, we usually it's quite challenging to achieve this uh, high efficiency level. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers the questions. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if anybody has uh, any complementary question, they can also ask it at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, a question from Salma, nice presentation. I wonder how can you control the contamination with other bacteria? Ah, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, that is quite a very, thank you for the question. That's uh, also very, um, that's also uh, quite challenging to control. But actually, uh, when we do with microspheredics, so uh, there's a step in the, um, in the sorry, in the microspheredic device production, whereby we do a corona, um, Sorry, uh, the corona uh, bonding. Yes, the corona charge uh, in order to uh, um, in order to produce the device. So this step is um, it actually helps to uh, produce a very quite sterile uh, drop. Uh, sorry, a quite sterile uh, device. Okay. So and other than that, uh, when we do bacterial bacterial studies, it is not advised to use uh, the same device for all of your experiment. Okay, to, in order to control the contamination. Okay, so it's better for like if you want to use like a different, if you want to make a different experiment, it's it's better for you to to um, prepare a new device all the time. Okay, so actually in our study, the device that we use are made from PDMS. Okay, so we can always make. Um, many devices prepared for a certain uh, experiment. Okay, um, but if you really need to use that one particular device, you can also. Um, but if you want to use it again, you can also um, clean the device, like flushing it with uh, ethanol and then uh, rinsing it with Diana's water. But it's uh, not very uh, advisable to do so. So it's better for you to keep on using uh, new devices. Um, uh, every time. Okay, I hope that answered the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Very detailed answer. <laughs> uh, a, a question from uh, Eric Robles. Uh, how do you keep the O2 level during growth? And uh... oh. yeah. Okay, so actually the oil that we use is very bi it's a biocompatible uh, oil. So it's actually a mineral oil. Okay, so it's um uh it's O2 permeable. So that's why, but uh but as you can see here the growth in the uh what in the water in our droppers are not we are not be able to maintain and that is not because of the auto level it's actually because of the depletion in nutrient okay but in the, the water in all in water droppers we are able to maintain the growth because we are able to um you know uh uh introduce the nutrient in the w2 phase so that's how we maintain the growth of the uh, bacteria okay I hope that answered the questions. <laughs> uh, a question from uh, Jeff. Oh, I'm glad because I see many names of people I'm very often uh, in discussion with. So, uh, so yes. hi everyone. Uh, so, uh, a question from Jeff. Thank you for the presentation. Do you have an idea of how well oxygen will transfer from the outer W oh. phase to the inner water phase? I guess that's pretty much close to the, the same question, previous yeah. question. Yep. Yeah. Uh, do you have any complementary elements, Sue or Sue? Um, yeah, like I mentioned before, you, that's why when we do encapsulation, bacterial encapsulation in double emulsion droplets, you have to make sure that the oil that you use is actually compatible with the bacteria that you're encapsulating. Okay? For, in this case, for example, we use mineral oil, which is biocompatible. So that's why uh, we are able to maintain even the surfactant that we use. We also have to make sure that the surfactant is not in um, ionic surfactants, for example. Okay, So because the ionic surfactant will also... Um, this is... I. Sorry, I go like outside of the question a little bit. So when you do use like ionic surfactant, it will affect the growth of the bacteria because the bacteria will interact the, with the surfactant and this will cause, uh, this will affect the viability of the bacteria as well. Okay, so it's very important for you to ensure the material that you use for encapsulation. Yep, all right. I guess that's also answer 
Kira uh, Yohan's question, uh, question uh, who was asking you? Yeah, this? it's the factors. Yes, <laughs> I did use, I, I forgot to mention. Actually, uh, we use a non-ionic uh, surfactants. In the oil phase, we use PGPR, while in the outer phase, this is for the double water in oil in water droppers. In the outer phase, we use 280. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so, a question from Ali. Thanks for the nice presentation. What do you mean by high, uh, high monodispersity? How much CV does it have? Uh, okay, it, less than 5%. I'm not remember, I can't remember the exact number. It's, uh, maybe it's around 1%, okay? A coefficient of variance. Okay, so mm. that's how highly monodispersed it is. So, if I think, if I'm not mistaken, if it's higher than Sorry if I'm wrong. It's if, if it's higher than, I think, 10 or 9%, that means that the droplets are not monodispersed uh, at all. I mean, not mm -hmm. monodispersed. Uh, okay. So mm -hmm. the, the higher the CV value, the the much more uh, not monodispersed the droplets is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I'll, I'll uh, add on to this that... Uh, I mean, we regularly work with um, with a droplet generation system and the standard yeah. CV we see is definitely below 2% with pressure-driven controllers. Yeah, That's I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very bad with numbers, so I can't remember exactly. <laughs> Uh, that's all right, but that's definitely a typical number that can, achieve, can be achieved with warp pressure control systems. Yeah. All right, a uh, question from uh, Jesus. Uh, hello, thanks for the great webinar. I have some questions. Are they possible both anaerobic and anaerobic conditions inside the droplets? And what are the key points to avoid coalescence in the droplets? And finally, how can we control the bacterial concentration to achieve single cell encapsulation? Okay. There are three questions in one, one on aerobic and aer anaerobic conditions, which I guess yeah. we spoke about a bit before, but I guess you can carry on on this if you have. Yeah. Yes, it is possible. Okay, It depends on the method that you use for encapsulation. You are able to uh, achieve the aerobic and anaerobic uh, condition as well. There are, I think there are some papers uh, already reported on this as well. Okay, mm -hmm. and then uh, the key points to in order to avoid coalescence is, of course, to use surfactant. Okay, so surfactant can um, uh, help to uh, decrease the coalescence uh, of the droplets. And also from our study, we we find out that bacteria can also act like the pickering particles that can also you know in, improve the the stability of the droplets as well. Mm -hmm. Right, and then uh, finally, how can we control the bacteria? Was the okay, so. And the concentration. Okay, so for the cons battery concentration, uh, unfortunately for my study, I didn't do single cell encapsulation. So uh, from what I read previously, so it it pretty much um, uh, to achieve like a single cell encapsulation is uh, you cannot get like a perfect single cell single cell encapsulation. So you might have like a few droplets containing like three uh three cells or four cells and then some most of them got like one cells okay so it depends on the concentration of this uh, of the uh bacterial solution that you use in the at, at the start of your experiment and also uh the production i mean the what's the word uh the production of the droplets uh as well okay so this the speed the rate of droplet production as well also can uh, affect uh, can help in to achieve the single cell encapsulation. So there's, um, I think there's many papers that explain this as well uh, that you can find out there. Yeah, to, to, add a bit on, to add a bit on top of what you're saying, so, uh, the yeah. uh, the bacterial concentration of uh, follows the Poisson's law, mm -hmm. and so obviously uh, it, it, it what, what matters most is the initial concentration of the solution. But mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot evit, uh, you cannot. Uh, be hundred percent sure that they won't be like yeah. two cells encapsulated in in the same droplet. That's almost impossible to, yeah. to actually. Uh, uh, another question from Andrew. So, why did you move from syringe pump to pressure controller for your double encapsulation? Sorry, uh, can you uh, come again? Uh, so that, that's all right. Why did you move from syringe pump to pressure controller for double encapsulation? All right, so uh, this is a very funny question, <laughs> yes. Because we did use syringe pump at the beginning. 
uh, and it is, it is because we need to use like a different flow rate for all the, the um, solution that we use, the W1, the oil and the W2 phase. So we need a different flow rate for all of them. So it's very quite challenging to control uh, three separate syringe pump at the same time during the experiment. So that's why it's um, very much um, preferable to use the pressure controller for making the double emulsion droplets as compared to the syringe pump. But mm -hmm. yeah, you can also use syringe pump, but it's just that, um, you know, it is due to preferences. So I much prefer to use the pressure controller. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can quickly on it's top of that, is, is that also with pressure controllers, you will achieve much better stability of your system yeah. overall. And so that will allow you to have a much better CV and, and standard mm -hmm. deviation of the droplet size. And so obviously, uh, when you do double encapsulation, that's something you you have to be very careful with to maintain the to to maintain your your droplet very very constant. Um, uh, did you so question from Rikesh? Did you test survival rate of any obligate uh, aerobe bacteria? Obligate aerobe bacteria meaning. Uh, um, sorry, don't, I didn't really get the I, question. I'm not. I'm not quite sure I get it either. If uh, Rikesh, if you can rephrase just to make sure that we okay, are. Okay, so. Yeah. I, so I'll just say that from our study, we do uh, two types of bacteria. First of all, uh, we also did on probiotics, which is the lactobacillus uh, uh, on other than uh, the E. coli GFP. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, uh, the for the single water in all droplets, yeah, both of the bacteria are not able to survive inside. This is because of the nutrient depletion, basically. Okay, and then uh, for the double emulsion droplets, uh, the viability improves. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's from our study. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, you see, so I guess there are three questions left to go, to go through them uh, uh, quickly. So if you would like to cultivate bacteria uh, mm -hmm. at the end, how can you segregate the bacter bacteria oh, yeah. from the droplets? Yes, very very good question. It's a very good question. Yes, you have to segregate the droplets first before you can do plate count. So we actually uh, do centrifugation. So we we, uh, we sort of break the emulsion droplets. Okay, and then we take a little bit of sample. Um, I don't know how to show you, but we break the samples first and then we and then only we do plate count for the uh, for the A mm -hmm. uh, quick question from uh, Muhammad. Uh, what is the size of the encapsulated materials like micro nano? And secondly, microfluidic mm -hmm. encapsulation technique is also applicable for food bioactive compound. Need your expert opinion. <laughs> uh, uh, what is the size of the encapsulated material like micro nano? Oh, yeah, it can reach any size, basically. <laughs> If you read many papers, uh, they've uh, they've already encapsulated like nano size. They also already make like nano size uh, droplets as well, micro size droplets. So, um, but yeah, because it's micro size, uh, if the the encapsulated material is much bigger, it will be much problematic for you to encapsulate it, it inside the droplets. Yeah. And then, uh, secondly, if I can complete, uh, if I can just give a couple more uh, information yeah, on this. Points, please. <laughs> the, the typical droplet size that can be achieved with a flow focusing system like uh, Sue showed uh, is basically in the order of uh, roughly, say, uh, 10 to 250 microns. Mm -hmm. When you want yeah. to generate larger droplets, you can definitely do so using, uh, for instance, T junctions or simpler droplet generation technique. Yeah. What am I saying this is that basically whenever you have a droplet, you can very easily encapsulate whatever is whatever is smaller inside this. So definitely mm -hmm. in the micro nanometer scale range, this is definitely not a problem. Oh, and, yeah. and carry on to you on the second part of the question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for helping me to answer the question, Robin. No yeah uh yes it is applicable for food bioactive compound as well yeah if you can encapsulate bacteria why not encapsulate a uh, bioactive compound mm -hmm. yeah you can, you can encapsulate everything i even yeah, though basically all, anything yeah you can encapsulate particles uh beads of whatever you can think of so yeah that's definitely doable chemical uh, reagents many things yep. yeah a question from Junaid, uh, can you please list the, uh, the factors that affect growth of the bacteria apart from the ionic surfactant? And do you control the size of the droplet via pressure alone? So uh, 
We'll go ahead to again answer the second part of the question if you like. <laughs> <laughs> the factors that affect the growth of the battery apart from the uh yeah, as I mentioned previously, uh when actually I didn't I didn't mention in the uh, presentation slide uh in the beginning. So actually in the water in oil droplets, we also observed that the because of the stress, because the drop uh, because of the nutrition depletion, bacteria also goes into like the uh sort of a dormant state and they started to form like a clustering of droplets okay so this is like the survival way uh the way the bacteria survive under um under stress okay so um yeah we did um so other factors i would say is uh the use of the uh, materials that you use for encapsulation for example the type of oil that you use and then also the new, the 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 availability of the nutrient for the bacteria as well uh and then um yeah i think and also uh i think these are two of the most important factors for uh bacteria encapsulation okay and for the control size uh yes for my experiment yes we did um other than the because we only have like a uh once Actually, you, you can also control droplet size with this with the size of the junction of the microfluidic device as well. Other than the pressure uh, that you use for the um, for the different phase, but in our study, we only use a, a single device with a single uh, one uh, one type of size only. Okay, because we don't need like uh, different different size of droplets. Okay, maybe Robin would like to add on that. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to give more information tonight. Um, um, so, so to make it very simple, there, as you mentioned, there are two main parameters that have to be taken into account uh, mm -hmm. when uh, considering the droplet size. The first one is the size, the size of the junction in the flow yeah. focusing uh, in the flow focusing design. The size of the junction will basically give you a rough estimate of mm -hmm. the, 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 the droplet size. And then you can consider that you can uh, generate droplets around that size or so around the size of the nozzle. And you will fine tune it using the pressure control system to achieve your perfect and your very precise uh, droplet size that is very constant over time. So that's the two parameters, the junction for mm -hmm. to, to, to give the, 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 the estimate and the pressure to fine tune it, all right? Yeah. Does it? I hope this answers your questions. So I as perfect. It, well, there there is one last question, uh, which I believe is extremely interesting. So I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask it to you, Sue, and uh, and I think that's gonna be the the, the last question for for today. <laughs> uh, how do you make the cheap hydrophilic? And have you used any materials like PVA? And does it does not it affect the bat the bacteria or cells? Okay. Uh. Yeah. Uh, no, we use a uh, polyelectrolyte uh, multiple layer. This is from the studies by Bio, Bio 2016. Mm -hmm. So we use a polyelectrolyte multiple multi layer. So it consists of PSS, polystyrene supernate, and PAH. Okay, I'm not, I, I can't, rem I don't know, I can't remember the long name now. <laughs> so it's PSS <laughs> and PAH. So uh, this uh, two, um, these two solution will, uh, will be, um, there's a, a uh, so you flow these two uh, solution um, continuously through the device, and then you will get layers of this uh, polyelectrolyte um, materials, the PSS, PH, PSS, PH, and then that's how you make the device to become hydrophilic. And it is quite um, quite interesting, and it's quite stable. Okay, I, I did store the device for like one week, for example. I, I did test that, and then the device are still you know, pretty much hydrophilic after one uh, one week of storage. Yeah, so it's, it is quite, very much stable. Good. Great. Thanks for so this. find the paper if you're interested. It's from Bauer 2016. All right. Sounds good. Uh, uh, I think uh, because of the timing, we might have to leave it here. But yeah. uh, thank so you. I'll thank you. All of, all right, thank you first, uh, Sue, for being here today and for this very interesting yes, and thank you. presentation and answering all these questions. So if you guys have any more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us at contact at We'll either forward the questions to Sue 
or uh, we also are on the droplet side and we also have some biology specialists so we are also happy to help here at Elvifl if we can so yeah feel free to contact us and uh, yeah. thanks all for the presentation and for your very kind comments so yeah have a good one and i uh, wish you a great day thanks you again okay thank you robin bye thank you bye